Hi everyone, my name is Matteo and I'm happy to be presented at MySQL Badge of Days. I am part of the MySQL organization and I focus on ML and artificial intelligence. Today we would like to briefly talk about the automatic capabilities that we offer in MySQL. First of all, two words about myself. I've been working on machine learning AI since 2011, right after my PhD in mathematics. I joined Oracle in August 2018, but until uh, recently, I was part of the labs organization, and I joined Heatwave in uh, November 2022. Could you speak up just a little bit? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I used to have all this, now I have kids. But I still managed to squeeze in some skiing, uh, alpine skiing, and uh, ski touring from time to time, as well as uh, biking in the summer. So, can we later talk about the uh, MySQL Eater Flake House? So, I will not get into the details here, but in general, what MySQL Eater offers, apart from accelerating uh, analytical workloads that, uh, that for which the MySQL core database is not so good for, it also allows to process data from public storage. So it also allows us to offer uh, help with MySQL and non-MySQL workload, and uh, it scales to many, uh, up to 512 nodes, that can process up to 500 terabytes of uh, data. But focusing on the AutoML capabilities, um, AutoML is a, um, maybe we'd like to run a little survey in the audience. How many of you consider yourself to have a work knowledge of ML? Okay, let that calibrate the slides. Well, then. <laughs> so, AutoML is a well known concept in the ML community, and it it's commonly offered in many flavors. Cloud vendors offer services for that, or uh, there are also Python packages that people can use for AutoML. And in general, the purpose is to democratize the process of building ML models so that you don't need to be an expert in machine learning. You don't need to have uh, to hire a set, a uh, team of data science, but you can already get to a reasonable machine learning model just by trusting uh, the optimal functionality. It can be a mixture of estimation of different model heuristic that will depend on uh, the, each, each vendor or each package has uh, their own take on it, but essentially the idea is you can get to a reasonable model with a very low number of parameters, very low number of parameters, and uh, a low level of knowledge in the ML required. So, um, in the case of Heatwave, we can actually leverage the Heatwave cluster for ML workloads, and that's because the resources that uh, are used for accelerating the analytical workloads can also be used for AutoML workloads. It's actually a different type of uh, workloads. It's completely independent of the analytical queries. But part of the resources can be used for these AutoML workloads. As for analytical workloads, tables must be loaded to it with memory before any ML operations. And uh, this is quite important for resource consumption. The Equal cluster always gives priority to all our queries. In particular, many ML operations don't even run if there is an analytical query currently. So, I've already mentioned briefly what AutoML is about, but in Equal, we offer one additional uh, advantage, which is we do in database AutoML. So, AutoML, not only, uh, not only we have a fully automated ML engine that requires a minimum number of parameters, so we can avoid the need for advanced ML knowledge or to, or, uh, to our data scientists, but we can also make sure that the data and the ML model never leave the, uh, never leave the database. So this has perform, this can have uh, obvious performance uh, 
uh, advantages, but also in terms of uh, managing the model, managing the data, we can do what we're used to do in, uh, in databases. So we can back up, we can encrypt data, etc., etc. Furthermore, we can do ML by using a familiar SQL interface instead of having to learn about some uh, new API that a specific ML vendor offers. And as I was briefly mentioning before, there are also performance and uh, scalability advantages. So, basically, it with OpenML um, allows us to manage the entire model lifecycle in database. And since the audience doesn't know much about ML, I think it's right that I will briefly walk through what are the typical steps of a model life cycle and how we can do each of each and every of these steps in people for the web. So the first step is always training a model. And that's typically the part where automel mostly helps. Why? Because model training machine learning is the part that usually requires more computational resources and also the part where uh, we do have to have a certain amount of uh, ML expertise. We need to know which models we can use, which algorithms can, we can use, which are the most useful for a certain task, and we need to know what the different parameters mean, how to pick them, etc., etc. This is also the part where uh, the E-Wave AutoML uh, offers the most advantages uh, with respect to running, auto, uh, running machine learning workloads yourself because we can uh, leverage some of the know-how that, uh, uh, that has been present in Oracle uh, since several years. In fact, the AutoML functionality in uh, E-Wave is uh, leveraged as the core of the functionality is the same that is offered in the data science service. This was developed by mostly the same team. In particular, this allows us to have a high level of automation of model training for various types of tasks. We have classification, which the most typical classification task mm -hmm. would be, uh, is this a dog or a cat or a uh, can you, uh, or can you please uh, tell me, uh, uh, can the model please tell me whether this certain, uh, this certain customer uh, belongs to the, uh, belongs to, <coughs> sorry, to which group it belongs. In terms of what the user needs to do, they only need to prepare the training data that contain the key data attributes for the relevant task. This is something that AutoML try to help, but cannot make up the most important data. The user needs to, uh, the user is the one who has the business understanding of the data, and so they need to prepare the relevant table, relevant data on a table. What AutoML then does is it takes the data from this table and performs all the steps necessary for training. Depending on the task, this can be pre-processing data, selecting the features, and uh, for uh, this is only supported for some tasks at the moment, but we can also do automatic hyperparameter queue, the automatic model selection. Furthermore, as part of this uh, training step, we already create the corresponding explanation model. So I was mentioning for before, this is where we do uh, uh, we do offer a lot of advantages and where uh, the core of uh, the core of the value proposition is we uh, for training we have an high performance architecture that can scale very well with the cluster benchmarks have shown that we can be 25 percent faster than redshift the ml at uh, producing model that's part of the work that has been done in labs to um, automatically select the best model and Faster training doesn't only mean, that's quite important actually, faster training does, doesn't only mean that you save money because you spend less on computational resources, but it also means that you can retrain your model much more often, precisely because it doesn't cost you that much. And more frequently training will, in general, lead to better quality because your model will, will not get stale because of uh, 
with its distribution changing. So, in order to be able to train a model, we offer a store procedure. All the AutoML functionality is under the prefix ML underscore. And basically, we need to provide the name of the table that contains this prepared data I was uh, talking about before. For some tasks, we also need to provide a target column that contains the ground truth values. Some, uh, some tasks in machine learning require this column to be present because the machine learning model will learn from provided example how to make its decision. We also have uh, a, JSON, uh, a JSON parameter that contains, uh, that can contain many training parameters to, uh, to tune the training. Oh, sorry. But it's quite important that most of these parameters are actually optional. Um, you can get into that if you want to get some more control on, uh, onto your model, but the only important parameter that you usually need to set is call task, and that specify which event task should be performed. So whether you want to do classification, whether you don't want to do regression, whether you want to do anomaly detection, etc., etc. The last parameter is a model endo. Uh, we'll get into that in a moment, but it's basically a session variable that stores the ML model endo uh, for the duration of the connection. And that's what we then use to reuse the same model uh, across the other operations. So, after we have uh, trained a model that gets automatically saved into the database, and before being able to use it, we need to load it. I briefly mentioned it gets stored into the database. In fact, uh, there is automatic model management uh, that's performed uh, by AutoML for you. All the models that are generated by the ML train store procedure are stored in the model catalog, which is uh, a table in the user ML schema, and it will be created if it doesn't exist yet. Each row of this table will contain the ML model itself, stored in a block column, uh, as well as the uh, corresponding metadata. And in terms of the database, this makes ML models into effective first class citizens. So we can integrate them in all the standard uh, database procedure, backup, restore encryption. And it also makes managing access to models or sharing models between uh, users uh, easy. We can uh, follow the usual procedure we use for our uh, tables. So I was saying the model endos that we create for model train only exist for the direction of the connection, but sometimes or oh, more often than not, we need to reuse a model in a different session. But these model endos, endos are also stored in the model catalog, so we can always retrieve them by querying the model catalog. So in this case, I'm basically taking the last model I've trained by ordering by model ID the second. So, to load and unload the model from memory, we have uh, two very simple sort of procedure. It only needs the, to load the model, we only need the model handle, which might be this uh, session variable or might be the stream loaded uh, from the model catalog. And we can also specify the username of the model order. If now, it defaults to the current user. Now, since, uh, as Kamo was saying pre previously, um, memory is a very precious resource in uh, the EPF cluster, we also give an uh, explicit sort of procedure to unload the model from memory, and it's actually recommended that when we don't use the model, we don't need the model to uh, unload it, so you can free the memory up for other resources. And that's as simple as it can get, you just need the model. Anyway. Okay, after loading the model, we would like to use it, but wait. You don't yet know 
that uh, whether the model is uh, good for the task, sure, you can trust the optimal procedure that it did an excellent job, but I wouldn't recommend to do it. I'm not saying my colleagues will be, don't do a good job, but it's simply good practice in uh, a man that before you use the model in production, you always need to evaluate the, and test the model on some data that uh, the model hasn't seen yet. So we need to evaluate the so-called generalization performance of the model, how well the model can uh, perform on data that it has unseen during training. So whenever we prepare the data for training, is uh, the best practice consists in uh, creating another set of data that has the same uh, type of attributes or the same columns, but they're not the same data points. So depends on the data that uh, you have available for training. If you have a lot of data, it won't be a problem. But if you only have one data set to work with, usually you only use part of that data for training and you reserve the other part for testing. Um, model evaluation is admittedly the only part where we currently require uh, a minimal knowledge of uh, machine learning and data science because it requires us to choose an appropriate scoring metric and requires the user to understand what the results of the scoring metrics are. Um, there isn't a unique answer on the most appropriate metric and it will depend on the business need because we might want to prioritize a low post positive rate, maybe the model that we want that we are going to be is going to be the results are going to be examined by operators and the appetite uh, appetite of these operators for false positive is uh, really low so we need to prioritize the false positive rate and there are metrics that are able to capture that or instead what we cannot afford is to uh, miss some true positive so we need to detect as many true positive as possible and the cause of of the positive rate doesn't matter. And in that case, another score metric would be the round step one. Well. If I'm sure, usually the two choices that are really in the middle between these two and uh, that work reasonably well across the spectrum would be accuracy, which simply says how many of the prediction were correct. So which percentage of the prediction were correct. And the F1 score, which is basically a balance metric between these two aspects, uh, prioritizing the false positive rate versus prioritizing capturing as many positive as possible. So, for uh, evaluating the model, we offer, uh, we offer a procedure called MS score. As I was saying before, it does require to have uh, uh, to the choice of uh, a metric. Apart from that, it's uh, basically you need to specify the table on which you want to run a score. As I was saying before, you don't use the same data that you use for training. The data should have the same format, but it should be different data points. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to measure how well the model will be performing in production. Other than that, we have additional parameters to specify session variables for the, uh, our results. So we have an example here. By calling this uh, ML score uh, function, we can then uh, select the score session variable and we get, this is balance accuracy, we get 95% balance accuracy which basically means our model is uh, accurate and uh, 95% of the time, which is actually in general quite good. So after this, after this step where we check model quality and we feel confident that our model will perform well in production, we can start to uh, generate differences which basically means we apply the train model on new data points that uh, weren't used during training. Here in this case, um, 
the architecture of Heatwave is actually quite nice for uh, doing model inference because it allows us to scale out the inference process given that we have a cluster. Moreover, the fact that the inference is performed in database where we usually already have the data on which we want to run inference means what I was saying before. Uh, the uh, performing everything in database means we have to get used, we completely eliminate any data movement and we also eliminate any concern about data security. There are two different needs depending on application, depending on the application. We might want to generate different results for uh, a single observation at a time or for a small number of observations. Or we might want instead to generate the inference results for an entire table of observation. The first might happen more in a live application of sorts, while the second might happen in batch workshops that run every night or so. So that's why we do offer two different uh, ways of uh, doing prediction of, of uh, doing inference. We have a store function that allows to generate inline inference for one or more rows of data. We simply need to specify the input data. In the case of a single row, we specify the raw data in JSON format. For multiple rows instead, you, we should use, uh, we should specify the columns in input data, and the actual data will come from by selecting from a data. So here we have the two examples. We see here we have the actual data that must be passed as part of the stream. While here instead, we just need to specify where the data is coming from in the table and then it will get populated. For predictable, which instead of a store function, we have a store procedure, which is uh, even uh, which is a bit easier to use. In addition, uh, we need to specify where the output should be stored. Uh, if the table already exists, we are going to throw an error. We don't want to uh, run the risk of overwriting data. Uh, but other than that, both, op uh, both uh, the store procedure and the store function will support the same options. So, the final step in the model life cycle is explaining the model results. What does it mean? Well, more often than not, whenever you use an uh, ML model, the user will look at your results, will uh, ask themselves, wait, why did the model did that prediction? Why does it think that uh, this uh, pers person, for instance, who applied for a loan should be rejected? That, that customer is going to ask why he didn't get the loan, right? So the person who is going to use the model needs to understand that. And that's why there exists in ML this uh, entire field called ML, ML explainability that exists precisely to make sure that we can understand how the model reach certain decision. There are some simple type of models in machine learning where explainability is uh, easy. Decision trees are a very good example. You can follow the tree and you can see how the model reach their uh, decision. But for other models, you need other techniques. We have two types of model explainer in uh, E2FML. We have prediction explainer that work at the level of a single prediction, prediction and are arguably the most useful for the customer because they understand, uh, they allow to, uh, the customer to understand for each prediction, what features contributed the most to a model's inference results. We also have support for model explainer that allow instead to identify the overall behavior of the model by identifying the features that are, have globally the most impact on the model. This is really mostly to understand what characteristics the model relies on globally, but it doesn't tell you anything about a specific about a specific uh, prediction. Explanations are generated as feature importance and they range from minus one to one. The minus two indicates the strength of the feature impact. So one or minus one means the feature is really important, so it, it really has a big impact on the prediction. 
while the sign indicates basically the direction uh, of uh, the importance, whether it contributed towards the prediction or away from it. I will not spend much time on the model explained API because it's essentially the same as the, uh, for the predict API. We also have in this case both a store function and a store procedure. We also need to pass the data the same way. And we just have a different set of options, a much more reduced one. As I was saying before, the model is, the explanation model is already trained as part of model training, so it doesn't require any extra step. Okay, with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much.